Okay, folks, you're all welcome to a meeting of the uh, Justice Committee. Um, feel free to use your electronic devices once you've done the needful. Um, if there's any declarations of interest related to the business, now is the time to declare it. Not. Then apologies. Um, there's no apologies. I think um, Gemma is joining us yet via the Starley facility and Shane Bradley. And I'll just ask the clerk if anyone has delegated their votes. Thank you, Chair. Um, the Deputy Chairperson, Linda Dillon, has delegated her vote to Emma Rogan if she has to leave the meeting before it finishes. <coughs> and Gemma Dolan has delegated her vote to Emma Rogan in the event that the Starley connection is lost. Thank you. Item two, then, is the draft minutes of the meeting that was held on the 8th and 10th of December. And uh, if members are, first of all, content that the meeting on the 8th are a true reflection of the proceedings, then I can sign them accordingly. Members agreed. Content. Agreed. And if members are content, then, that the meeting of the 10th of December is an accurate reflection, again, I can sign them. If members are agreed. 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 Okay, some matters are rising. One item um, is the personal injury discount rate. There was a press release issued from the Association of Personal Injury Lawyers. And uh, they have provided that's been provided to committee members, um, along with then a copy of that press release regarding the legal challenge that it is bringing against the Department of Justice in relation to its decision not to change the personal injury discount rate, and uh, that can be found in your tabled pack. So, if members are content, we will write to the Department of Justice and ask whether the permanent secretary. Um, is intending to review the decision not to change the rate at this time in light of both the legal challenges that were uh, advised to the committee and in light of the committee discussions that were that took place. And if members are content, we will write to the department in that respect. Good. Agreeable. Okay. Item four is then a finance briefing, the January monitoring round, and officials are joining us to give us a briefing on the January monitoring round and the budget for 2021-22. The relevant papers are pages 16 to 50 of your meeting pack. So hopefully um, the broadcasting people can bring in from the audience, the team there, yeah. So uh, can I welcome, um, hopefully, Lisa Rocks, Deputy Director of the Financial Services Division, Andrea Quayle, Financial Performance, and uh, Louise Blair uh, to the meeting all from the Department of Justice, and as normal, this will be recorded by Hansart and a transcript published in due course. So I think, Ms Rocks, I'm going to hand over to you at this stage, and you're going to provide us with a, an outline, and then we'll go to members' questions. So, thank you. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to update the committee on the Department's January monitoring round position. I am joined today by Andrea Quayle, Head of Financial Planning, Strategy and Support, and Louise Blair, Head of Financial Planning and Support. Today, we would like to provide you with an update on where we are in terms of the current financial year as part of the January monitoring round. But before I get into the detail of that, let me talk first about the next budget. Minister Murphy issued a written ministerial statement on the 1st of December informing the Assembly of the funding made available for Budget 21-22 as notified by the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland on the 30th of November 2020. We understand that consideration is now being given to the setting of a draft budget, but at this point we do not have a draft budget for the Department. Once we know the draft budget, we will want to engage with our spending areas to ask them to update their budgetary impacts based on the draft budget set. Directors attended the committee on the 5th of November to discuss the information gathering exercise, which was conducted across the department, and we provided further correspondence in response to further committee queries. By way of an update on information gathering, the department submitted a response to the Department of Finance on the 27th of November in relation to a new decade, new approach, unique circumstances funding exercise, which was based on the information already included in the returns to the future year's budget exercise. Bits were sought that could meet the criterion of supporting community and reconciliation initiatives to remove barriers, bring the people of Northern Ireland together and build a safer, more secure society in Northern Ireland. The four bids which we included in our response totaled £16 million and were in respect of tackling paramilitarism, the Gillen review of serious sexual offences, speeding up justice and additional police officers 
to facilitate delivery of the NDNA agreement. The Department has not yet received the outcome of this process. Until we have a draft budget, we can't say much more, but we will come back to the committee to discuss what the draft budget means to ensure your views can be considered before the Finance Minister sets final budgets. Turning now to the main area for discussion for today, the January Monitoring Round, which is the final monitoring round of the year. It has been a particularly unusual year in terms of budgets, where at each monitoring round we have provided our best assessment of activity in a COVID-19 environment. This year has been very volatile in terms of being able to forecast our spend, but we have worked across the department, five agencies and eight NDPBs to closely monitor the position in order to manage the departmental budget. In terms of where we are regarding the department's resource position, following the October monitoring round, the department was holding £2.1 million worth of funding, mainly for anticipated pressures due to a potential shortfall in court fees and equipment for working from home as a result of COVID-19. COVID there are no longer any pressures in these areas as court business has now increased and therefore income has increased and any costs relating to working from home will be managed within current budgets. The departmental budget included two ring-fenced elements. Firstly, the additional COVID-19 funding provided by the executive was ring-fenced and as part of the January monitoring round exercise, the department plans to return £4.6 million of this funding. This is mainly as a result of a £4 million easement from PSNI, which is specifically in relation to PPE, where costs have been less than anticipated, and half a million pounds as a result of the increase in court's income. We also plan to return a small element, £318,000 of EU exit funding from Access to Justice Directorate and the Courts and Tribunals Service due to a delay in filling posts. In addition to the funding held, which can now be released, there were easements highlighting, highlighted in the January monitoring round of £7.1 million, meaning there was a total available for reallocation of £9.2 million. These easements came from a range of areas, mainly as a result of the Courts and Tribunal Service having £2.4 million worth more of receipts than anticipated, compensation services forecasting £1.5 million less settlements than previously anticipated, a million pounds of other COVID-related easements and delays in filling posts of £700,000. These easements allowed £8.5 million worth of funding to be released back to legal aid, where activity was greater than originally anticipated. Your written briefing will refer to a £7.8 million reallocation with a potential to allocate a further £700,000, and this has now been confirmed as required. It is important to set this into context. As part of the original estimates of the impact of COVID-19, we anticipated a much greater impact on the income of courts and had also anticipated legal aid spend to be much lower. Rather than bid to the centre, we sought to try to manage this within the departmental budget and we took £15 million out of the legal aid budget based on forecasts at that time, which was at a very early stage of the COVID-19 pandemic and it was extremely difficult to anticipate with much certainty what the impact would be across the justice system as it was with many areas. The committee will be aware that we released three million pounds of funding back to legal aid as part of the October monitoring round process and we now need to put a further eight and a half million pounds back in to ensure legal services agency have sufficient funding to meet their needs this year. That was the key element of the department's January monitoring round. The Department of Finance allowed full flexibility as part of the January monitoring round and on this basis this reallocation of funding does not need approval from the executive. In terms of remaining pressures, there are a number of small pressures below de minimis levels across a range of spending areas and these were funded through internal reallocations. The committee has previously been advised of potential pressures in police overtime and Nightingale courts due to the impact of COVID-19 the current assessment is that these can now be managed within existing budgets this year. Overall, taking all of this into account, the Department leaves the January monitoring round in a break-even position in terms of resource. In terms of capital, easements totalling £3.7 million worth of funding were identified mainly as a result of delays in IT projects, 
disposal of assets and the costs of the Northern Ireland Temporary Resting Place. A number of small pressures below de minimis levels across a range of spending areas will be funded through internal reallocations, leaving £3.4 million of funding which will be returned to DOF as a reduced requirement as part of the January Mundering Round, subject to any late changes. Overall, again, taking this into account, we leave the January Mundering Round in a break-even position in terms of capital. As part of the January Mundering Round, we will also update our net cash requirement and increase our annually managed expenditure budget, or AMI, as you may hear us refer. It is difficult to assess AMI requirements with certainty at this point, as they are dependent on a range of factors. For example, valuations by the Government Actuaries Department in relation to pensions and provisions based on a year in position. The Department's January Mundering Round position will be reflected in the Spring Supplementary Estimates once it has been agreed by the Executive. In conclusion, I hope I have provided a useful overview of where we are now in terms of the financial position. Whilst things are startling, starting to settle, given the continuing uncertainties around COVID-19, it still remains subject to more flux than would normally be the case at this point. We'll continue to keep the committee updated as the position develops. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to brief you today. We very much value the role of the committee and we're happy to take any questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Lisa, for that overview. That's been very helpful, and uh, I appreciate the context uh, in which you're operating. Isn't the norm when it comes to um, the COVID-19 issues and how that's impacted on the department. So I accept that, that context that's been set for some of the the decision-making processes and the <coughs> kind of vulnerability of being precise uh, earlier. In terms of the, the budget for next year, um, I've just one question on that, uh, and again, I accept you're still waiting in, in terms of that, but if I can just ask, within the NDNA that you, you mentioned, one of the commitments was around increasing police numbers. Is that being factored in, um, in terms of a bid that will go forward from the department to, to start seeing uh, increased levels of uh, police officers to fulfil that commitment that was in that agreement? Yes, that was part of the original submission we made to the Department of Finance on the 28th of September. So that is certainly part of the bids, and I suppose any decisions will be dependent then on what the final budget is set. And can I just check for clarity, because I know that's to increase the numbers by around 500, and obviously there's an issue there around practically how quickly you can escalate it to that. So is there any indications as to... You know, is it for an additional 100, 150? Um, is it, have you that level of detail at this stage? Um, well, I suppose what I can say is by the end of this year, the PS and I were using overtime, reduced overtime costs to move to 7,000. Um, I can't. I would have to check the detail of how many they're doing their phase in over two to three years to get to the seven and a half thousand. As you say, it's hard to deliver that quickly when they take into account recruitment, but I can go back and check what in terms of 21, 22 that number is. Okay, no, I'd appreciate that, thank you. Um, to, in terms of then the, this financial year, um, just sticking on the police for now, can I just ask the police settlement around their peg increase, um, I think it was around 2.5%, that's what in GB they have received in September. Is there any indication when the department uh, is able to finalise its discussions with DOF? For, for that to uh, actually be authorised? I'll need to check with sponsor colleagues, but my understanding is that's now been approved. Okay. I, I know it's, um, it's imminent based on a response I got from the Minister, um, so I would welcome that if that has been um, officially confirmed. Um, in can I just ask on the IT around the capital, um, just, just remind me what the de minimis level is how much can be spent without having to go to the centre for approval on capital? Well, the normal process would be a million pounds in any one year. You could move money around less than a million pounds, but we have full flexibility this year, so we could move more than that. Um, so the, the three and a half million capital funding that's being returned to DOF, there were no other projects that could have been funded without returning that to the centre? No, and I think part of the difficulty there, we'd handed back some capital in October as well, and I think spending areas are seeing the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic in terms of procurement and getting people on site, so capital has been a bit slower. 
this year, so there was nothing else we could have redirected that to. Okay. Um, and again, difficult, I know, to have predicted in the previous monitoring round how much could have been surrendered back to the centre, um, which I know it's always preferable that the sooner a department can release it, the better to reallocate elsewhere. Um, it, was there any way that some of this money that's being returned to the centre could have been released earlier than the January monitoring round? I don't think so. And as part of sort of regular processes, we would be challenging all spending areas, and those questions would have been asked throughout the year. You know, particularly in the areas of our bigger capital spend, so police and prisons in particular. So I think we've done all we could to identify it. So um, I don't think we could have identified it any sooner. Okay, thank you, Lisa. I'll take members at this stage. So, the Vice Chair, Linda Dillon, first. Thank you. Thanks very much for the, the briefing, Lisa. The, there's just one part I'm, I missed. You may well have covered because you have answered actually a number of my questions in, in your briefing. It, it was very um, clear and concise. Thank you. You see the 0.3 the million that went back in relation to Brexit? What was that originally intended for? And and why it couldn't be spent. And I think you might have actually covered this, but I was trying to take a note on the previous bit. Yeah, so no, it. It, was, it was in terms of staffing for access to justice in courts where there'd been a delay in filling the posts. So I think at the minute it's quite difficult to fill posts. Okay. Um, so that is flushed out as an easement. Okay. And that, obviously there's a, a delay, but will consideration not be given to the fact that those posts still will have to be filled and how Absolutely, yeah. So it would still be our intention to fill those posts going into 21-22. Okay. Um, and just then, in relation to what the Chair has just said about, you know, where money could potentially be moved around, obviously there, there was um, money returned that possibly could have been used to address the backlog within the courts. Was there a potential for that? At all? Um, I think it's fair to say, and Louise keep me right. Um, I suppose as the volume of activity has been increased, you know, there still is, we're not up to full capacity in the courts. Um, we've talked about the Nightingale courts and are hopeful then of opening those facilities to try to clear as much backlog as possible. But I suppose some of the difficulty is also, much as the court sites are open, they still have to accommodate social distancing, which makes that a wee bit more difficult. So really what you're saying is it's finance wouldn't fix the problem, the problem is, is a different issue? Okay, yeah. fair enough, fair enough. Thank you. Are you Gordon Dunn? Thanks Chair and thanks for the briefing. I have a previous Annex, Annex 1 from uh, a previous briefing that we got on, on the budgets. Um, my understanding was that for the fitness financial year for COVID, the prison service was getting 11.5 million, the courts 12.1 prison service uh, 13 and PPE was 11 uh, million. So you, you told us about returns, for example, the court services return is at 2.4 million. Is that out of that 12.1? It would be, uh, I would need to check detail back to the previous briefing to be honest. This return that you're talking about, 2.4 is from this financial year. Is that not correct? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Up to the end of March, all been well? Yes. Yeah. So, um, and, and the police service, according to my figures, they, they were planning to take, it would take 13 million and they're returning 4.6 million. Isn't that right? They're returning four, they're returning four as part of this monitoring round in relation what? to PPE because PPE is ring fenced. Yeah, it was down here as pressures in maintaining critical services, increased costs from contractors and increase to the levels undertaken of annual leave and so on due to the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And would there be other uh, funding coming back in relation to PSNI because thankfully the pandemic never really developed that much, I suppose, over the year because of the controls that were in place? Is there, is there likely to be other savings from even across the various departments? Not at this point. Again, we've challenged all areas. And as recently as this week, we've had the conversation with PSNI again about their forecast year end position. And at this point, we don't anticipate any more. Okay. That's not to say that it won't come out between now and March, but certainly at this point, based on the most recent estimate, 
Um, there's nothing further to forecast. And the prison service, 11.5 in the prison service, is that fully committed then, that money till the end of March? Perhaps. Um, obviously, the prison service, they're, the environment they're operating in, they're, they believe that they have sufficient funding until the end of the year, but obviously until we know the outworkings and how things develop after Christmas, um, we'll just have to keep it under review, but they do believe they have sufficient funding for this financial year. Yeah, and these are all extra costs, isn't that right? Over and above That's their right. normal budgets. That's right, yes. Yeah. And can I just ask, are you working from the audit office figures? It's just it's difficult. Are you working from the audit office report? No, this is a paper that you've presented at possibly three months or six months ago, and it was an Annex 1 that I kept here in my file, thankfully. I could certainly okay. get, get you a copy of it, but um, it, yeah. and, you know, it was a summary um, of the various activities in excess of £1 million in response to COVID-19. So that, it talked about the COVID-19 related activities to be £54.8 million in this financial year. So I take it, it it will be much less than £54.8 million for the department to meet the, the requirements of COVID. Would that be fair? It is. And just looking back, actually, the £54.8 million pounds comes from the Audit Office report, of which at that time the forecast spend was 497 in 2021 because it covered the two years. And it's important to recognise it as a sort of point in time. Um, at the last point, we thought the costs were in around about £46 million, pounds, but as part of the year end, we'll need to go back and assess what those costs have been. Um, we had originally assessed them to be £51.8 million, pounds, but they did reduce because of police overtime and further reductions in prisons, and we know that court's income has now come down. Um, they did take account then of working time directive costs um, and were able to reallocate easements, but again, the costs have come down mainly as a result of the court's income, and we'll revisit it again at the year end, but that report was at a point in time. Okay, thank you. On Project Dignity, it cost at £4.9 million initially. Are we still occurring costs there in relation to maintaining that facility? I think Andrea has some costs for the temporary version here. <coughs> the, the resource cost for 2021 for the temporary resident place will be in the region of £1 million. Pounds, and capital costs for 2021 are expected to be in the region of £3.5 million. Pounds. For this project dignity? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And is that over and above the 4.9 or is that included? No, so the original estimate to build the Northern Ireland Temporary Resting Place, I think, was about £4 million pounds and it reduced. And then there's the ongoing running costs then. So in this year, the running costs are estimated to be about a million pounds. And then, as Andrea said, then they are due to reduce then into 2021. And I suppose the final cost will depend on what requirement there is to use the facility. It sounds excessive, really, for a facility that thankfully never was used, but we trust it will never be used. Um, just moving on, Chair, um, in your on page 30, it talks about pressures, um, pay and price. For next year, we're talking uh, to 20 million and in the next, the following year, it's jumping up to 42 million, and the est obviously these are estimates under pressures. Can you just clarify why we're, we're, we're jumping from 20 million to 42? Is that for the additional police officers, as Platt talked about? I would presume that to be the case, because that would be the only significant increase that there would be on pay. Although I suppose it's important to recognise that now it'll be a one-year budget. And so I suppose the decisions that will happen for 2023, 22, 23 will depend on what is affordable in 21, 22 as part of that budget. Okay. Just on the transformation, it, it next year's planned at 11, 11.8 million, and then it drops down the third year to 4.2. What is the transformation again? Apologies if you have it. No, no apologies. Um, the most significant element of that is the PSNI Digital. So um, it's the outworking of the SOCs that we had talked about. So where there, there are three areas, the police officer numbers, the digital and IT. So 11.3 of the 11.8 relates to the digital. Um, so 
the majority of the investment would be made in the year one. But again, it'll be a year one budget, so it depends on what, what is affordable in 21 22 as to what the latter years look like. Well, this digital is this a, a new system, an IT system and for PSNI? It's a whole range of areas, as I understand it. So it's not just one IT system, but it's a whole range of digital investment by the PSNI. And they will tease out further detail of that as part of their outline business case. So at this point, they've submitted and had approved the strategic outline case, which sets out the strategic direction. Um, but the OBCs will then tease out further detail. OK, thanks very much. Thanks, Chair. OK, thank you, Gordon. All free. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Can I take you to page 20 of our report, which uh, I'm not sure. Uh, it's basically, well, it's, it's, it's basically your paragraph on your budget 21, 22. And, and I, I, I know the, the issue around the multi-year budgets that we had all hoped for. Can I ask, uh, by, by, by way of a percentage, how much work have you completed on Budget 21-22, <coughs> and when then that needs to go to the Department of Finance for for ratification or approval? Well, I suppose what went to DOA for 21-22 was what we submitted at the end of September, um, which was the basis of the oral briefing on the 5th of November. So we've continued to refine that in the background. Um, DOF are using that as the basis of the recommendations that they will make on their budget and for the department we've continued to seek to refine those pressures because they are significant and I suppose if there's not a lot of money available in next year's budget the most difficult decisions will be around the prioritisation that will need to be done to live within the budget. And what dates have you been given by the Department of Finance with regards to when that will be solidified and you will know? Well, I sort of feel like working in finance is an emotional roller coaster, um, which is that we sort of we keep thinking we're going to get a draft budget pre-Christmas. So I think we had anticipated that we may at this point have a budget, but that hasn't been the case. So we just we wait further news from the Department of Finance. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, and then on page on your table one, uh, with regards to pressures, and you had it laid out in a multi-year. Uh, uh, a very hopeful uh, graph there with regards to a, a multi-year, three-year budget. Uh, so can I ask then, uh, Gordon has asked about paying price. Can I ask about the other pressures? Because whilst I know that you're on a graph like that, you're always going to have a, a, a line with other. It just seems substantial that we've 19, 19 20 million in that bar, that line. Can that be bro broken down in any other way to give us more detail as to what the other actually constitutes? Yes, we can do that. I suppose it's, and I can give you a few of the sort of bigger areas now. The challenge is always in trying to create something meaningful for the Department of Finance to understand the kind of key areas. When you get into the core department and five agencies and eight NDPBs, you're kind of spreading those, although it looks like a big sort of 20 million figure you're spreading it across quite a range of organisations. But I suppose the bigger ones, to pull them out, um, £4.8 million pounds worth of that is the Courts and Tribunal Service, and a lot of that relates to staffing. £3 million pounds of it relates to legal aid. A million pounds of it relates to staffing. £1.2 million relates to victims and witnesses. And then that sort of leaves a balance in around £9 million across all of those organisations. OK, thank you very much. Uh, can I then ask you about the COVID-19 budget line. Uh, can, and, and remind me again how much the department spent on COVID-19 uh, this year. We need to go back and revisit how much we've actually spent on COVID-19 because I suppose we had the early assessment of the 52 million and we've seen that continue to drop. Um, not Some of the spend on COVID will be diverted from other normal areas of spend so we do need to go back out and capture that as part of the year-end process. But, but do you, you feel confident enough to to put 36 million on that COVID-19 line at this present time? And can you explain to me exactly then what that would be spent on? Because it surely it couldn't all be PPE. No, it's not all PPE. Um, 
when you refer to 36 million pounds, I presume you're talking about the future year forecast? Just yes, sorry, the, the table, table one under pressures, yes. Okay, um, I don't have it in front of me, um, but it was the main element, I think, was about 12 million pounds in relation to the prison service, which is a combination of social distancing and PPE. Um, so that was 11.1 million pounds of it. The PSNI is 8.7 million, um, which again is social distancing, PPE, and some IT. Um, courts were still forecasting five million of an income shortfall, but in certain budgets we'll need to revisit that. Um, now that we know that court activity has been greater, and nine million pounds were related to legal services agency, and again I think we'll need to revisit that in the context of what we've learned through the January Mondrian round process which is that activity has been much greater. So at the time, we had anticipated there would be a period of catch up next year. So we can see those costs coming down quite a bit. And I think as part of the submission, we also said this was could potentially be the worst case because it's difficult to forecast what will happen with future wage, waves of COVID. Yeah, and I understand that, that the, the, the crystal ball gazing aspect of it. Uh, I think we all have something for you in that regard. Uh, I understand with regards to the court scenario whereby there'll be a loss of income, uh, but it, when it's purely operational like uh, prison service and even police for that matter, uh, when you talk about social distancing, I take it you're talking about physical barrier apparatus material, and if that is the case, surely the one spend did it um, in implementing the measures. Why would we need money for social distancing in the future? My understanding, and I'm hoping Louise might be able to keep me right here, um, I think an element of this also relates to the social distancing of prisoners and in sales, which would be an ongoing Absolutely, issue. there's the additional cost of staffing um, with additional accommodation being open to ensure that prisoners are in single cells at present because of the obviously the, the issues with COVID. Okay, that, that explains it then. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Rachel Woods. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for your presentation today. Um, a lot of my questions have already been answered, but I just want to follow on from what Gordon was discussing with the temporary resting place at the Kinniger. Um, and you might have um, mentioned it, and I didn't catch it, sorry, but how much bid has gone in for next year? There hasn't been a bid place for next year in the temporary resting place. Um, we were able to capitalise some of the equipment so the actual running costs for next year are, in Andrea's point of, I think they're about three hundred thousand um, pounds. So we haven't bid for them; they're bid below de minimis. Okay, it's just um, my understanding is that it's still um, going to be closing in twenty twenty two, and there hasn't been any movement, obviously, on the sale of the land. So, would there is there ongoing conversations um, about the future of that land in itself, and when would a decision need to be made on? when running costs kind of stop if it is going to be sold on? I would have to defer to my colleagues um, in the relevant area and come back to you, Rachel. No problem, thank you. Um, in terms of the... Uh, you mentioned about bids have been put in, totaling about £16 million for Gillen, tra tackling paramilitarism, speeding up justice and for additional PSNI numbers with a new decade, new approach. Are those the departmental priorities for 2021? No, the request in the exercise was just to capture things that were under NDNA, under the banner that it referred to. So it was just pulling out the elements of the existing bids that fitted under that heading. Okay, and have, is there any indication of what the priorities will be for the department going forward next year? I think it's really difficult to say in the context of what the budget will be. Um, I think when the Finance Minister had announced the budget figures, it doesn't look like there's going to be a significant amount of funding available. So I think there will be a significant amount of prioritisation having to be done. Okay. Um, in terms of the Nightingale Courts then, has an agreement been signed um, with Belfast City Council and Laganside? And if so, when is it going to be open? And is there an expected budget on this? Um, we don't, I'm not sure if the date, Rachel, would have to check that, but in terms of the running costs for this financial year, we expect it to be just over half a million for uh, the Nightingale facilities, both within Belfast and the regional facility, and a small amount of capital of 50,000. Um, and then with regards to next year, they're just um, currently obviously considering what the requirements might be um, in terms of social distancing and the need to extend any of that. Okay. 
Um, and obviously that would form part of any bid going forward for next year's budget. Well, again, that would probably depend. You know, it will depend on the actual requirements. Um, this year, they've been able to manage it within the existing allocations. Um, and again, it really probably just depends on the scale of it. Okay. And I suppose I would also add um, that I think that COVID potentially might be treated slightly separate to the budget, so it would be part of our COVID bids. Okay. Thank you. And finally, just two are quite interlinked then, um, and have been mentioned about the. 3.7 billion in funding for capital with regard to IT and then a delay on filling of posts which has caused some finance to be returned. Will that then form part of bids going forward for next year if those posts are going to be filled for next year and if the PS and I are intending to upgrade IT um, and, and, and in the department anyway, is that going to be forming part of next year's budget? Um, I suppose on the 318k which was returned on EU exit, um, that would have been part of non-protocol funding, so we would hope to secure EU funding going forward. But again, you know, we'd have to prioritise depending on the funding that was available. And in terms of the capital that has been given back when we set the capital budgets, it would be for those areas to prioritise within their capital envelope. Okay, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Rachel. Um, Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Chair. Um, most has been covered. I was just trying to follow through on, I know Linda and Rachel both touching it there. So what started out, am I right, as EU exit money is flushed out through the system as an easement in terms of um, the 1.5 million, I think 700k was referred to in terms of the jobs. I just want to get that clear before I move on to my next question. The easement was the 300. Um... Is it 318 million, 315 million, 1, <laughs> Okay, but the, there was 700,000 referred to then, another figure for the um, jobs, the, the recruitment that didn't happen. So did that start out as Brexit money? And then it's captured as an easement? I just couldn't follow the thread of that. I'm trying to find the point seven to which you refer. Um, we did give an additional 0.7 to legal services agency, um, yeah. but in terms of funding handed back, the main element was the amount of PPE for police on 318,000 of EU exit. Okay, I'll revisit that myself. I just wasn't following that thread on it, and I know it did quote that 700,000, but I couldn't figure out where that had started from. Um, in terms of then, and most has been covered, but I'm conscious that. Um, you know, we have a quite a heavy legislative programme running through for the remainder of this mandate. And it, it's becoming very evident um, that although it, it may not be seen to have any great financial um, impact at the outset, there clearly are, and I'm not saying to the same degree as New Decade, New Approach or whatever, um, but there have been along the way, for example, the domestic abuse bill, it's evident that you know, partners across the Justice Agency will have costs associated with the delivery of that bill. And are you satisfied that in terms of your forecast for the years ahead, that the legislative programme is being captured in there, that all the partners who are submitting for their anticipated costs have fully embraced um, the legislative programme that's in front of us? That should be the case because part of the normal process would be, you know, that the areas that are developing that legislative program, they will go through a process which will involve then an economic appraisal, and then they will highlight at that point whether there are affordability issues, and at that point then, you know, it's triggered into finance whether or not there are bids required. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Emma. Thanks, Chair. Um, again, some of my questions have been um, answered, but it's, it's really regarding the Nightingale Courts. Um, you, you had mentioned in your, your presentation, or, or just briefly, that um, it was hopeful that, that the Nightingale Courts would clear the backlog of, of cases. Um, was there any thought given to having a, a Nightingale Court in any other areas rather than Belfast City Centre, like, say, west of the Ban or, or, or Derry, that sort of direction? I can honestly say I don't think we'd have to check out and come back to you. I understand there is a regional facility um, for what courts have advised me in Banbridge, but nothing else other than there in Belfast, so we'd need to confirm that with courts. 
Okay, and um, you, you did touch on this, but the, can you just explain to me again why there was no, why there's been no bid in relation to the Nightingale Courts? The court service were able to fund the, the costs from other savings that they've had within the year. For example, um, savings in um, juror expenses and so on, so that they, they, they haven't had to, to seek additional funding for that. Okay, that's grand. That's all my questions, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Members, any other questions? Chair, sure, just briefly. Yes, done. Uh, the Chief Constable has been very keen to, I suppose, rationalise the estate uh, structure of the PSNI and uh, also to invest in it. What long term plans are there for, for capital schemes and for major investment within the estate of PSNI? Is it in? PSNI. Apologies. Go ahead, sorry. Thank you. And um, PS and I had developed their strategic outline case for estates, which would look at that and would set out the funding then that they would require at that level. Again, it'll be teased out in the detail in the OBC, but again, that'll depend on what funding is available. Yeah. And are there are you aware of long term plans for, for major changes in the estate management? They've set out some of the change in the strategic outline case, but further detail will be in the OBC. So it's early days for it? Yeah, absolutely. Right. Okay, thanks, Chair. Chair. Thank you. Linda Dillon. Just in relation to Gordon's question, there probably will be quite a substantial amount more detail within the policing board in relation to those questions. Yeah. And, and it's, it's, I think that if um, you were to get your members on the policing board to ask, it, it, they do te tend to go into quite a bit of detail within those committees around that kind of stuff. They do give quite, I would say, detailed information that the department probably wouldn't be across at all. But you would certainly get it within the policing board and within the committees in the police. Okay, thank you. Okay. okay. So can I thank you and your team um, for taking the time off the committee today and hopefully you will get some kind of a break over Christmas. I wish, Hopefully. I, I wish as well. Oh. Happy Christmas. Thank All you. Right. Thank you. Right. Take care. Thank you. Okay, members. Um, so there's a few points there, obviously, that the department will, will come back to us on. And um, Christine, just I'm sure, will have taken a note of some of the issues that will be. So we'll get that in due course. Item five, um, protection from stocking bill then. The Minister has indicated that she is seeking executive approval to introduce the Protection from Stalking Bill in January next year. In the meantime, she's provided advanced copies of the bill and the EFM to the committee. Um, departmental officials are scheduled to brief the committee on the principles of the bill at the meeting on the 21st of January. Um, so if members are content, we will note those papers and take the briefing when it comes through. Yes, Mr. Frey. Can I raise a point? I was going to raise that any other business chair. Uh, but when I see the stocking bill up, and it's, it reads very similar and formatted very similar to the domestic violence piece that we've just went through, uh, which brings me to my point. I am deeply concerned about the stance taken by the Justice Minister of late with regards to the executive part uh, regarding any bill that comes from her department. Now, I, I get that she needs to seek executive approval for the passage because it's a government bill ultimately, and I get that. But the, the play out of amendments to me is a very secret thing, and there's real, I think, real concern that there could be, uh, if you like, a, a freeze impact on, on members now coming forward with amendments. What I mean by that is this. If any member of this committee or the committee itself uh, uh, decides to put forward amendments, we as individuals will seek permission from our parties to do so, and that may well be granted or other ways. But if it's granted, that will then go on to the Marshall list. If the Minister then sees that a list, uh, or, or the Marshall list even, and she is resistant to that amendment for whatever reason, maybe financial, maybe policy, or it may be something else, for her then to go and seek that her executive colleagues and their parties therein would align with her belief, I think is a potential for grave damage to the democratic process. 
So at that point, does that mean that a party will go to a member of this committee or the committee chair and say, we now have to align ourselves as a party with the government minister, no matter what party they're from, and you will then have to remove your amendment. Or we as a party will have to vote against your amendment. That, I believe, is a grievous position to be in, especially when we, probably we, the members of this committee, are the ones who have scrutinised the bill, have a, built up a knowledge of the bill, and will know more about the, the, the bill and the clause we're pursuing, and the amendment we're pursuing, more than any other party probably in the chamber, and maybe even within certain department bodies. So it, 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 it is a body of concern that I am really, really concerned about because of the impact that it could have on not only the stocking piece, but also the miscellaneous piece. And that, that worries me. I, I, don't, I don't think it worries me so much in the committal piece, but when we have our legislative programme coming forward with two major pieces of legislation coming before us, I, it really concerns me that, that there would be this, this, this freeze impact that members then might not want to bring forward amendments whenever we may well see gaping holes in legislation which need filled. Um, I'm not suggesting the committee actions anything at this point, unless all the members want to come in, but I just want to place it on record I, my deep concern at this point. Thank you. <clears throat> I know obviously the Minister played out her position on all of that. I know from our perspective as a party, Paul, um, uh, and I'm not privy to executive discussions and all of this, but I know that you know whenever a bill, uh, for example, domestic abuse, got to go ahead, it was on the provisions that we would be interrogating it as a party through the committee stage, and we would then seek to change, um, rather than having an agreement front and centre before it even starts. So, uh, in terms of our party, um, the the go-ahead at executive level for a bill being introduced is absolutely not conditional upon us then uh, not doing our work at a scrutiny level and bringing forward amendments. So how Naomi interprets the way she wants to operate and the way she views the executive is a matter, I suppose, ultimately for her. Um, but it certainly didn't dictate how our party approached the domestic abuse, and nor will it when it comes to any other bills. Linda? Just... Again, to give clarity around my own party position, nobody within the executive understands, certainly for my party, understands any of the legislation that's gone through this committee in the detail or anywhere near the detail that we would understand it. And any issue around amendments around the bill itself, the direction was taken from the members on this committee, not the other way around. And that, and that, has, that was very clear. Um, from from the beginning, and our minister being clear about that, and I mean, as Paul says, out, outside of that, I don't involve myself, nor do I want to know what's have enough to keep me going my own work. Um, but anything that that arose or any issues that arose, they couldn't respond, they couldn't answer. They had to come to us for direction because only we could say what we believed was the right position to take in relation to something, as we had scrutinised it in this committee, as we had got responses from the department, which which they wouldn't even have access to to be, to be part of them, and haven't discussed among ourselves and with our own committee staff and, and others and the witnesses. So, I mean, I, I think it would be madness, and I, I don't think it would be the case, or certainly wouldn't like to think it would be the case, that any party would take any other approach, to be honest with you. Sinead? Yes, Chair. Um, I think the member did raise a good point, but you know, it's, it's I suppose, not called a legislative process for no reason. It is a process. And I don't think um, the minister seeking approval from the executive office is suggestive that that process is complete. If anything, it, it triggers the beginning of a process. And what did come to light and is definitely of concern to me is the timing of that process and the windows of opportunity that exist between stages in that process. And, and I do think um, we as a committee would do well to maybe try and control or hold the minister to control in the timeline of any future legislation to a better accord because you know we, we all know that on the domestic abuse piece um, although there was many shared views on many pieces on that 
there wasn't sufficient time in amongst those um, windows that were created quite dramatically at some stages. Uh, and great efforts were made by many to try and find middle ground and to react in certain situations and engage with sector. And, and I think a lot stemmed from my view to the absolute absence of space and time that existed between some of the stages. And I think as a committee, we would serve well to monitor closely though that in any future piece that's coming in front of us. I think this, that bill was unique in, in the sense of the way it was delayed and the restoration of the institutions. But I don't think the time frame is one that will be applied to other bills. Although, I should say, some of that was outside of our control because consideration uh, stage was delayed by a week and that then removed a week you know, in terms of con stage and further con stage and that, that was outside and the control of this committee and, and doing that. So, but Just to clarify, I, I use my terminology freeze impact. I'm all for broadening the English language, but what I really meant was chill factor. I just couldn't get the terminology out. So, OK, well, listen, people have made their, their points on that, and uh, I think the department, just like the committee, well, there's a, a an ability to reflect on the processes and the way in which engagement takes place, and I'm sure that'll help improve things for the next set of bills. So, when, sorry. Yes, sorry, Linda. Can I just place something quickly on, on the record? We did respond to the consultation on the Stockham Bill, and I have to say the department took on board all of our um, recommendations in the response. So I do appreciate and I do hope that that is the vein in which we will be moving forward. And that's not to say that everything's in there that you, that you want in there, but certainly everything we asked to be put in at the consultation phase was put in. So... Um, we are grateful for that. Okay, well, listen, the, the briefing scheduled for the 21st of January. Then item six, um, the department's proposing to make a statutory rule that would amend various instruments relating to the PSNI um, and Police Service Reserve Regulations 2006 related to injury benefits. So the amendments ensure that the police injury duty scheme continues to work effectively for officers who join the career average pe police pension scheme that's established in 2015 so that they will have the same access to benefits provided through the police injury benefit regulations as are available to officers who are members of the earlier pension schemes. The amendments also resolve the offset issue identified in the Northern Ireland Audit Office report. Published in March 2020, technical updates will also be made to the Employment Support Alliance and Incapacity Benefit. The proposed SR is subject to negative resolution, so it's whether members have any further um, information that's necessary, or we are content then to uh, we're content with the proposed statutory rule, and then that will come back. Yes, not to prolong the issue at all. I don't want that, but. Uh, some queries I have with some constituents and, and other colleagues with regards to uh, constituents they have. Uh, some of the questions they pose, and I've been trying to dig it out myself, and I, I just have run out of time, but they're wanting to know, does this change the actual payments uh, in any shape or form? And also then, does it provide for a vehicle to change in the future, whereby, uh, because of secondary legislation uh, and regulation, that uh, Numbers can go up and down with regards to remuneration. It was just some of the concerns raised with me uh, around this. And then if it is consistent with other maybe national schemes throughout the UK uh, and whether it's how, how that's formatted and deemed uh, a, uh, with regards to equivalence across the UK. Those are just some questions that I have po been posed, but I do not wish to hold up the process considering it is out of a uh, Northern Ireland audit report. Well, yeah, I suppose you're going to have, we'll have to find out. Um, Doug? Yeah, Chair, and I'm kind of, I, I kind of feel like there's a gap of information that I've not got either, and I think, okay. I think Paul has raised some of those issues. Uh, and when I'm looking at this, and I, and I know that the Police Federation uh, has responded to it, the, the consultation which took place, and there's a small synopsis of what their response was. Um, and, and apologies if I've missed it, but I wouldn't mind seeing their whole response. 
um, before I sign off on this. I, I, I don't think I've seen it. I don't think it's been made available. Yeah. So I would rather I would rather see their whole response uh, as opposed to just a synopsis of their response. If that was if that was possible. And again, I don't want to hold it up, but but you know, there's there's people out there who've got real concerns um, about how this manifests itself within the service. Okay, well listen, let, let's bring the officials up for a meeting in January then and um, we can ask them that and we'll also get that information and then members can sure. directly Sorry, to them. Can I cut in there, Chair? Yes, of course you need. Yeah, sorry, as far as um, on Doug's thought, I actually went looking, Doug, and I think you're right. I don't think we did get that. And as far as I could read from their synopsis, there were only four respondents. So it might be worth asking for the full detail on those four responses. Well, let, let's get then the detail around those responses, but in any event, um, we'll, I, I suspect it could be a very brief session, but rather than engage in a writing exercise and people still have questions, we'll get officials up um, for a meeting and hopefully we can put the formal question um, around the statutory rule at the same meeting um, if there's no issues brought up at that stage. And we'll try and factor that in to an already busy January. Okay, item seven. Um, the department has provided a written briefing paper on regulations to re-implement the Laguno Convention 2007. I'm not sure if that's how you pronounce it, but in any event, this follows a commitment from DOJ during the committee's early consideration of an LCM for the Private International Law Bill that the committee will be told. Uh, in advance if the Minister intends to provide or withhold consent for regulations made under the Bill. Um, the Convention deals with jurisdiction and the recognition and enforcement in civil and commercial matters between the EU, Iceland, Nor Norway and Switzerland, and the UK has applied to accede to the Convention as an independent member at the end of transition, um, which will require the agreement of all signatories to that Convention. So while the decision on the application is not yet known, Steps are being taken to prepare for the re-implementation of the Convention in UK domestic law and the Minister is of the view that the Westminster regulations to re-implement the Convention should extend to Northern Ireland. The Department has advised that these are technical amendments that have no policy decisions. So it's for members to indicate if they are content to note the Minister's position that the Westminster regulations uh, should indeed extend to Northern Ireland unless there's any further clarity needed. Yes, sorry, Lynn. No, I, I don't mean clarity, but I, I do think that I um, should highlight that this is only going to work if all of the other member states agree to it, and we could be in serious difficulties if it, if it doesn't work out the way we want it to work out. So I have some concerns in relation to that, and I just think it highlights again the issues around Brexit and the things that were not considered. This, this creates massive issues not least for um, families with who have different custody arrangements across your jurisdictions. So it does, it does raise a number of issues, and I know that we have certainly been lobbied by a number of businesses and farmers who will be severely impacted if this doesn't happen. So we absolutely support it, but we have the concern, obviously, that one member state only has to say no for this not to happen. Okay. On, on the core principle of it, though, members are content by way of the extension. Okay. Great. Item 8, then, the Department's intending to undertake a public consultation on a proposed new strategy to support and challenge women and girls who come into contact with the justice system. The consultation document has been informed by extensive engagement with stakeholders, including service users and partners within and beyond the justice system. Subject to any views the committee may wish to offer, the consultation will commence uh, the week of the 11th of January for a period of eight weeks. Officials are providing the committee with a briefing paper on the outcome of the consultation once it has been uh, concluded and a summary of responses has been prepared. So again, members, it's whether you're content to note proposed consultation and then we can consider the matter further upon uh, the results of that and the proposed way forward unless there's any other views. There's content. Okay. Yes, sorry, Emma. No, it's okay, just on that. Um, I think it, it's, it's welcome and, and we welcome that the department has acknowledged that the that women are disproportionately affected by this in the presence and, and in, in their briefing note. Um, 
you know, they, they did right. There's complexities within the, the system that has been designed by men for men and women weren't really factored into it. So it is, we are glad to see this happening. We had intended to go to um, the women's prison at Hyde Bank, but due to COVID, we weren't able to, to get. But we will, um, hopefully, touch wood once this has, um, allows us to, to go and visit and see the, the women prisoners firsthand. Linda and myself have been to the, the men's um, prison, but I think it is, and it's welcome that they are looking at the women's a strategy to support the women prisoners. Okay. Well, always beneficial to see them. I've been to all of them on numerous occasions. And the maze. Um, okay, item nine. Um, the department is intending to undertake a consultation on recommencing the policy of publishing annual payments to suppliers of legal aid. The consultation paper will seek views on a range of approaches to determine which information will be published and how that information should be presented. Subject to any views, the committee then may wish to offer the Legal Services Agency. It will commence a consultation period in January for a period of uh, 12 weeks. The following, uh, following analysis of the responses, the Minister will finalise the publication scheme and the committee will be provided with a post-consultation report and details of the then final scheme. So again, members of the tend to note the proposed consultation and then we will consider the matter further upon receipt of the results of the same and their proposed way forward unless there's any comments at this stage. Item 10. The committee considered the department's proposals to undertake an 11-week consultation on proposals to reform rehabilitation periods in Northern Ireland at the meeting on the 3rd of December and agreed to seek further information on any pre-consultation that had taken place with key stakeholders in relation to the development of the consultation document and clarification of the rationale used by the department to determine the length of the consultation periods. The department has responded advising that remote working, the impact of ongoing COVID-19 requirements together with the prioritisation of other primary legislative requirements has resulted in the department not being able to carry out any pre-consultation stakeholder engagement on this occasion. Officials did conduct desk research and engaged with counterparts in neighbouring uh, jurisdictions in the development of the draft consultation document. Uh, in relation to the rationale used to determine the length of consultation periods, the Department has outlined the position in relation to this proposed consultation, but has not provided information on the reasons for a variety of periods of time being set for consultations across the Department. Um, this proposed consultation will now run for eight weeks, beginning uh, January to the end of February. The Department will then publish a summary report on the consultation responses and has offered then a briefing session once those responses have been analysed and recommendations developed. So members, it's whether following this additional information that we are content to note the proposed consultation and then consider the matter further when the results of that consultation and proposed way forward are available or whether uh, any further information needs to be um, sought and again let us just write back to the department asking for a response to the original requests in terms of the rationale uh, around determining the length of the consultation periods given the various variations indeed the previous two that we've just agreed to one is 12 weeks one is eight weeks and so the inconsistency continues so let's highlight that um, I, I, that'll probably be one area to clear up with the minister when she comes in January um, if, if we don't have a satisfactory rationale for it, because uh, I know members it is an issue. So on that one, though, is there any further comments around this proposed consultation? Um, and where we will note then the way forward at this stage. Members agreed. OK, item 11 then. Uh, Department officials attended the meeting on the 15th of October to outline results of the consultation on proposals to amend the legislation governing the retention of DNA and fingerprints and the proposed way forward. Following the evidence session, the committee agreed to request the views of the NI Human Rights Commission on the Department's proposed way forward on retention of DNA and fingerprints and also to ask the Secretary of State to clarify how he intended to provide a lawful basis for the retention of DNA and fingerprints for the sole purpose of investigations into troubles related to deaths. The Minister of State at the NIO responded on the 2nd of December advising that a transitional order came into force on the 30th of October to avoid biometric material relevant to legacy cases from being destroyed. Uh, this will extend the period for retention of biometric material under counter-terrorism powers 
um, taken under counter-terrorism powers prior to the 31st of October 2013 until the 31st of October 2022. The NI Human Rights Commission has also responded, indicating that while the amendments to the initial policy proposals following the results of the consultation are welcome, it remains unconvinced that the proposals for maximum retention periods are compatible with human rights law and views the minimum retention period of 25 years as a high threshold. To begin with, the Human Rights Commission has raised a number of specific concerns regarding the proposal. So if members are agreed, we'll forward the Human Rights Commission response to the Department for its comments on the issues that it has raised. Rachel. Thanks, Chair. I would just wonder if we could also write to the Children's Commissioner, because the Human Rights um, Commission have raised a number of issues with those who are under 18. And certainly would welcome Kuda's views on that. Happy to do that if members are content then. Okay, then item 12, uh, Committee Forward Work Programme. Uh, there's a list of items um, that the Department has provided in terms of business that it would wish the Committee to consider at our meetings in January. Currently one oral evidence session scheduled for the meeting on the 14th and three oral evidence sessions for the 21st of January and the Department has advised that the Minister would be available to attend a meeting on Tuesday the 19th of January, the rescheduled one from uh, this week uh, to take place at 12.30 to 2pm and also, um, so I'll get the members just agreeing to that in a moment, um, Judge Marinan has also indicated that he would be happy to come to the committee to discuss the findings and recommendations of his review of hate crime legislation at uh, a date that suits um, him and the committee as opposed to waiting until the department considers and reports on the report. Um, so if members are content, we'll schedule the work programmes that have been uh, raised by the department for our meetings in January. Uh, also schedule the additional then meeting on Tuesday the 19th, um, to which then we could have the minister along to attend the, the, uh, to discuss some of the justice related issues. For agreed to that then, just to get some views then, uh, in terms of the one oral evidence session for the meeting on the 14th of January, um, because I suspect there will be a considerable number of written um, papers to consider uh, due to the recess, um, as to whether or not you want then a second oral evidence session to be scheduled on that date uh, with either the Commissioner for Children and Young People, which he, we had agreed to do, or uh, Judge Marinan. Sure. Right, could I suggest maybe if the committee's content we'll schedule the SL1 briefing because it's likely to be shorter. Um, either of those two briefings could be quite lengthy so if we schedule the SL1 for the first meeting back along with what we've got because there is likely to be a volume of written papers if the committee would be happy with that. Okay, well we'll need to find a time to, to have another oral session then some point with Judge Marin and, um, and the Commissioner for Young People. Um, we'd also asked, there was an oral evidence session with Sajini in respect um, of the treatment of victims and witnesses in the justice system and that was on the 21st of January. So we could move that because there's three oral briefings for that date. Um, so if we move that one and we'll schedule that again for a date beyond that but as soon as possible. Members content? Great. Four items correspondence then. Um, if you're content, we'll action them as outlined in the clerk's memo. Yeah. I don't have any business. Any other business? No other business. Then we are due to meet um, on Thursday the 14th of January in room 30. And I trust that um, we'll all have as enjoyable Christmas period once you finish all your constituency work, which I'm sure you'll be doing right up to late on Christmas Eve, but have a good Christmas. Okay, members, thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.